What's going on everybody? It's Ozzy from Oz Talks Hardware and it's been a while since I last did a budget PC build under 50 bucks, but statistically it looks like viewers seem to like that content more than my other content. It seems like I'm long overdue. But I decided to add a twist to this particular build. Instead of actively deal hunting, I proposed picking up the cheapest compatible components on eBay and putting it together into a computer and it resulted in this concoction right here. A few things before we begin. Firstly, I would like to thank LMG for the inspiration for this video. A few months ago, they uploaded a video where they built the cheapest computer on Newegg, and that was the main source of inspiration for this computer. Secondly, I completely ruled out using pre-built computers as a base. That just ruins the fun out of building a computer of this nature. And lastly, I do not have an accurate way of measuring the thriftiness of this build. I'm just assuming that it's the cheapest one that you can build right now. I use prior knowledge to to deduce the route that I should take, such as the motherboard socket, the processor, and any other ways that I could cut corners. But hey, if you think that you can build a cheaper computer, then hit me up on Twitter, comment down on the video below, or chat in my Discord server. I would love to talk about it. So, I built the cheapest computer possible on eBay. Let's see the specifications. I initially picked up a Dell Optiplex 780 Ultra Small Form Factor LGA 775 motherboard. I preemptively chose the 775 socket because its antiquity and availability made the CPUs and motherboards dirt cheap. I purchased the Optiplex 780 motherboard for $11.15. You have probably noticed that it does not have a PCIe slot, which was not an issue initially because I was planning on using the integrated graphics found on the LGA 775 processor I was picking up. But I decided that if I'm going to try any kind of dedicated gaming, I should get at least some kind of dedicated graphics card. So I purchased another 775 motherboard with DDR3 compatibility for about 13 bucks. The distributor pulled the OEM board from a Lenovo Think series desktop, but the crucial feature here includes that it has a PCIe slot for a dedicated video card. Paired with the OEM motherboard, I have the Intel Celeron 450, a single core, single threaded processor clocked at 2.2 gigahertz. And yes, I understand that the CPU will harshly limit the games or applications I'm able to run, but for only $1.25, it was a no-brainer for this project. I'd imagine games from 2006 and prior should run fine on the processor with the computer struggling more with games released in the last decade. Unfortunately, I cannot overclock the Celeron, although that wouldn't really do much because of the OEM motherboard and generic Chinese LGA 775 stock cooler I bought for $3.90. I would not dare to install these no-name brand coolers on a standard Core 2 Quad or even a Core 2 Duo, but because the Celeron 450 has a rated TDP of 35 watts, the cheapo fan should provide adequate cooling, but I will monitor the temperatures as a precaution. I picked up a single one gigabyte stick of DDR3 memory for only four bucks. Unfortunately, I could not find 512 megabyte sticks on eBay, otherwise I would have opted for those. Four dollars feels like a drop in the bucket considering the current state of DDR4 memory, so I'm still satisfied. The dedicated video card interests me the most out of all of the components chosen. I bought the part for $3.50 and it came with an S video and 59 pin digital output signal, two IOs for which I had no cables. Fortunately enough, I found a DMS59 converter online for under 10 bucks, allowing me to connect it to one of the monitors with a standard DVI cable. I understand that the Celeron 450 has integrated graphics like I stated before, but if I plan on gaming, I won't get anywhere with the integrated GMA950. With a quick part number search, I found the exact video card model online. The Radeon 3450 with 256 megabytes of VRAM, a 600 megahertz core clock speed, and one gigahertz memory speed. It looks like modern gaming may not be in the equation for this computer, but we'll wait and see. It supports DirectX 10.1, meaning that it meets the minimum API requirements for modern titles such as Overwatch, but I doubt the rest of the specifications will allow for an enjoyable experience. I found a 160 gigabyte hard drive on eBay for $5. The seller marked it as for parts and not working, but they did test the drive and disk manager marked the drive as healthy, so I took my chances. I couldn't say no to a 7200 RPM SATA drive for 5 bucks, so I'm excited to see if it actually works. The computer would surprise me if it sipped more than 150 watts of power while gaming considering the components I have chosen, so I purchased a 300 watt power supply for a measly 4 bucks. Now I cannot stress this enough. For computer components that you actually care about, 
do not cheap out on the power supply. I personally consider the power supply the most crucial component of your computer because it powers everything. So if you have a power supply that is not reputable, then the rest of your computer is at risk. I'm allowing a pass in this case because I'm powering dirt cheap components. So if one of them fails, then it's only a few dollars lost. But if you're powering your main computer, then please purchase a reliable power supply. So do as I say, not as I do, in this case anyway. I'm housing this monstrous PC inside the motherboard box of the OEM motherboard. I don't see the necessity of a case when I can utilize the box as one and essentially garner a similar effect. Plus, turning down a free component during this challenge is probably not a smart idea. As I commenced building the computer, I came across CPU cooler incompatibility between my Chinese heatsink and the OEM motherboard, the only issue I encountered when building the desktop. OEM manufacturers such as HP, Dell, and Lenovo often use proprietary hardware for their desktops and their cooling solution is no different. The OEM motherboard that I had did not have an LGA775 mounting system, but my cheap Chinese uh, LGA stock cooler did. And so I had to improvise with the only thing that's better than duct tape for a PC hardware enthusiast, and that is zip ties and lots of them. I unscrewed the fan from the cooler and wrapped four zip ties around the heatsink. After installing the processor, I zip tied the cooler to the Celeron through the mounting holes and tied the cooler to the motherboard as tightly as possible. Then I reinstalled the fan. My ghetto solution looks sound on paper, but I'll monitor temperatures to determine its effectiveness. I chose Windows 7 as the main operating system here because of its compatibility and performance. Windows 8 and above used more resources than I would like, and Windows Vista and below did not have the compatibility with a lot of newer software, so Windows 7 was a happy medium. I first tested Cinebench R15 to formulate an idea of the performance I should expect, and let me tell you, slow is an understatement. The Celeron scored 36 points. It officially takes the cake for the slowest Cinebench R15 processor I've ever tested. With that being said, I approached my benchmarks a little bit differently. I initially planned on benchmarking games such as GTA 5, but considering the very low Cinebench R15 score, I decided to take it out. While the computer is technically compatible with the software, the low score indicates that the performance would not be playable. And at that point, it's just better to take it out than to deal with the headache of trying to set it up and get it to run. After benchmarking Cinebench, I tested Rocket League at 640x480 using the lowest settings, and ironically, this was one of the smoothest experiences out of all of the titles tested, which doesn't really set the stage well for the rest of the benchmarks. I averaged 23.5 FPS, and a 1% low of 7 with the occasional frame jump about every dozen seconds. While I was able to keep up with the bot in this match, I would not count Rocket League playable on the machine as I am disadvantaged during online play. Secondly, I tested Counter-Strike Go at 800 by 600 using the lowest settings in hopes that I would have a positive experience. At last, I was mistaken, as CSGO stuttered and lagged the most with an average of 2 FPS, yes, just 2, and a 1% low of 0.1 FPS. The abysmal experience went unmatched during my benchmark runs. And lastly, I tried Cuphead, one of the hottest games on the market right now. At 720p, the machine averaged 32.5 FPS with a 1% low of 19. While I experienced the smoothest gameplay with Cuphead overall, the fact that the machine could not maintain 30 FPS at 720p for a game such as Cuphead is a testament to the computer's lack of power. And Overwatch, a modern PC eSport title, finally pushed the computer to its limits. I tried renting the game, but when I did, I was rid with artifacts and screen flashing, so I couldn't even get the game to open. After that, I called it quits for the games that I tested and I went on to general use and productivity. Now, web browsing completely depended on the website addressed. For sites with little multimedia on the page, the computer performed fine. Scroll lag and slight delays occurred, but nothing out of the ordinary. Irritable stuttering and lag seeped its way in when I visited heavier sites, specifically social medias. Delays and unstable processing plagued Twitter and Reddit, and I did experience a few crashes. Basic web browsing was fine, but nothing more than that. 
Multitasking became a mundane task for this computer. Using more than one application pushed the computer to its limits, and using more than two slowed it down to a stop most of the time. You can work with a few Google Chrome tabs open, less than four I would say, and this doesn't include social media sites, but you will need some patience. When I used YouTube, all the videos autoed to 480p. Now if you don't know about YouTube's algorithm, it's based on your internet speed and your computer speed, but most modern computers can watch videos at full HD 1080p, it's only in very rare occasions such as this one that the actual computer speed will hinder the internet speed enough that they have to drop the quality. So 480p worked fine. There was a tiny bit of stuttering here and there, but it was a smooth experience overall. 720p was definitely doable. It did take a few seconds for everything to load up and be ready to go. And there was a slightly more stuttering than 480p, but I still enjoyed it. And 1080p playback had enough stuttering and lag that it got in the way of watching the video. So I would say 720p playback is the highest I would go with this computer. In conclusion, the cheapest computer on eBay can't really do much. You can get away with retro titles and possibly games preceding 2006, but beyond that, there's not much that you can actually do. Even for just basic productivity and office work, it's hard to really justify the price and the practicality of a computer of this nature. Like usual, I will leave you guys with a few questions. One of them I already stated earlier in this video. Do you think you can build a cheaper computer through eBay only? And if you can, let me know in the comments below. I would love to see them. Secondly, do you have a computer this cheap or what's the cheapest computer you have owned or ever owned and what's the story behind it? Again, let me know in the comments below. I would like to read all of you guys' stories. But that's it for this video, guys. If you liked it, then leave a like. And if you loved it, subscribe and share because I have a ton of videos like this coming out in the near future. And I wanna end with a huge thank you and the biggest internet hug ever because we reached 100,000 subscribers. And initially, I never thought that I would ever make it to this point, but here I am. And so a big thank you for that. But <laughs> again, uh, if you liked it, and loved it and all that stuff that I said. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.